And I'd like to welcome you all to the third mutual Meet the Candidates Forum. We have six candidates vying for four positions, so it's extremely important that you pay attention today to their answers. We've got questions, they've got answers, and that you assume your responsibility and you vote when the time comes, okay? At this point, I would like to introduce to you our six candidates. Number one is Debbie Allen. Debbie, do you say good morning? Good morning from Minnesota. <laughs> and candidate number two, Andrew Ginocchio. Andrew, good morning. Candidate number three, Brad Reinhardt. Good morning, Brad. Good morning. Candidate number four, Donna Rain Jostak. Good morning, Donna. Oh, she has to unmute. Is Donna with us this morning? She's with us. She's having on and off network issues. So okay. She might have to log off again, but she's, she's present. Okay. Good morning, then, Donna. <laughs> uh, the wonders of Zoom. And number five, Moon G. Yoon, good morning. Good morning, thank you. And candidate number six, Jules Zeller, good morning. Good morning, good morning all. Let us proceed. As I promised, we've got questions, they have answers. We're going to ask the questions on a rotating basis so there is some um, evidence of fairness in answering and asking the questions. We will begin with question number one with Debbie Allen. Debbie, the question is... Uh, excuse me, David. Yes. I think uh, the rules provide that each of us gets three minutes to say hello and introduce ourselves before the question. Oh, yes, of course. Let's let's follow the agenda. Okay. So in that case, thank you, Jules. In that case, let us begin um, with Debbie with her three minutes. My apologies. Debbie? Oh, no. Well, I would like to express my gratitude for taking the time to acquaint yourselves with my background. Allow me to introduce myself as Dr. Deb Allen, an individual passionate about education, my community, and a diverse range of accomplishments. Throughout my career as a college instructor, I have been fortunate to receive tuition-free education, which has enabled me to pursue numerous degrees. These include a doctorate in higher education administration, a couple of master's degrees with one in legal studies focusing on law and public policy, a couple of bachelor's degrees, an AAS degree in legal administrative assistant, and a paralegal certificate. Over the past two decades, I've held the role of an instructor in the legal assistant program, as well as serving as an adjunct professor in paralegal programs and legal studies at multiple colleges. Additionally, I've gained valuable experience as a store manager for the Zales Corporation and owning an income tax preparation company. I currently serve on the Laguna Country United Methodist Church on their financial board. During the past year, I've been fortunate to be able to serve you in the role of a VMS board director representing the Golden Rain Foundation. I am also a Garden Villa building captain. And the second week that after I moved into Laguna Woods, I started attending GRF meetings along with their committees, third mutual meetings along with their committees, Garden Villa association meetings, and third mutual town hall meetings. I have learned much about how our community works by being on the board and attending these meetings. As revealed by the Gallup Strength Quest, my strengths lie in being a maximizer, strategic achiever, and futuristic. This means I am driven to refine and enhance existing processes to achieve the best possible outcomes. I can identify solutions amidst challenges. I have a strong inclination to accomplish goals, and I have an unwavering focus on the future, whether it involves technological advances or process improvements. My motivation to become involved with the third Laguna Hills Mutual stems from my previous experience as a faculty advisor to the Student Senate. And in that role, I often encourage students to engage with the Student Senate to understand their institution 
and contribute to positive change. Similarly, as a resident of Laguna Woods, I'm urging new residents to immerse themselves in the boards and committees to comprehend the community and actively partake in its evolution. Furthermore, I have conducted qualitative and quantitative studies that have provided me with a comprehensive understanding of effective leadership. I embrace a servant leadership style that prioritizes the needs of others over personal gains. By valuing diverse opinions and fostering a culture of change or culture of trust, I strive to empower and develop future leaders. As an advocate for residents, I recognize the significance of the th third Laguna Hills new time. Thank you very much, Debbie. You're and at this time, I would like to introduce to you our second candidate, Andrew Ginocchio. Please, Andrew. Sorry, you're up, sorry. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone, I'm Andy Ginocchio. I've been in the village about two years, of which uh, a shade less than a year I've been on the third board as an appointee. I strongly believe in elections, and I, I, I love this. I'd love to have the opportunity to interact with you. Really? Okay, sorry. Can, should I start over? Please, please start over. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Andy Ginocchio. I'm a newbie to the village. Been here two years, and a shade less than a year I've been on the third board as an appointee. Now we're going through an election, and I think that's great. I think elections are a great place to get to know people and to discuss issues. So look forward to it. With my wife, Gwen, I own a condo on San Amadeo between, near Gate 9. And I've gone to all the clubhouses, gone to a lot of events, and interacted with people. And I've heard a lot, but more importantly for you, I've listened. And there's stuff that needs to be done in the village. And I've got a unique background, I think, to do that. I have a really strong academic background, including an MBA from the University of Chicago, one of the top five schools in the country. But beyond that, I have tons of corporate experience in strategic planning, operational planning, financial analysis, operational analysis. I've served on many boards, civic boards. Most recently, when I moved to Costa Mesa 10 years ago, I got on the board right away. It was a troubled HOA. After several years, I became president, and it became obvious that the complex needed a complete renovation. Prior boards had kicked the can down the road. I seized it, and really, with personal oversight, it's a $1.7 million renovation, excluding the roofs, didn't include the roofs. Got it done on time and on budget. So I know the right way to do things. Uh, finally, on, this, on the third board, I've gotten to know people. I kind of feel like I know how things operate around here. There's the written stuff, and then there's the way it really is. And I think I'm starting to hit my stride in terms of figuring out how to be the best board member I can here. So I hope you'll trust me, you'll give me your confidence, and you'll vote for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. <clears throat> I would like to reintroduce our third candidate, Brad Reinhardt. Brad, it's all yours. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Brad Reinhardt, and I'm a candidate to join the Third Mutual Board of Directors. My wife and I have been married for 41 years and bought in Laguna Woods last April. We grew up a mile from each other in Wheaton, Illinois, a western suburb of Chicago. We have two adult girls that are married and live in the Los Angeles area. I graduated from the United States Military Academy at West Point and served as an armored cavalry officer at Fort Knox, Kentucky. I have an MBA from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. I'm currently the CEO of a publicly traded renewable energy company that does residential and commercial solar, battery storage, EV charging installations, and LED lighting upgrades. We are contracted with the federal government, the state of California, LA County, the National Park Service, and the Irvine Company. My wife and I have actively managed home renovations on multiple properties, including here in Laguna Woods. So we're very familiar with, and very happy with, the resident services, alterations, landscaping, and the Laguna Woods Building Department. I have served on an HOA board of a small community of 28 custom homes in Green Valley Golf Course in Las Vegas. 
I have been a high school and Pop Warner football official since 1982 and am active in the Orange County Football Officials Association. I also served as the president of the West Point Society of Southern Nevada for several years. Laguna Woods is a complex property. I feel that my broad background in business and social involvement would make me an excellent contributor to the community. I also want to spearhead a renewable energy strategic plan for our community. I feel that is an area we have opportunities in and want to help Laguna Woods become more energy independent over time. I was able to attend a portion of this week's board meeting as well. I was troubled by the increase, potential increases in dues. I was also troubled by the suggestion that we should reduce services to reduce costs, particularly by reducing the cleaning services for the 81 Garden Terrace properties. We need to reduce costs through effective negotiation and cost control, not by reducing services. I believe that we need to be a resident-centric community and be more involved in self-governing the community and the costs related to operating our community. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. And I'd like to offer our apologies. It would be very helpful if we could get the video uh, on the speaker as well as the audio. Is that going to be possible? In other words, we need to focus on the person who is speaking. Uh, our Granica system is down right now. That's why we are using Zoom, which is going to be that feed right there. So unfortunately, we can't um, zoom in on the speaker at this time. Okay. <clears throat> our next um, candidate for the third mutual board is Donna Rain Shostek. It's your three minutes. Thank you very much. Um, and as you said, I'm Don Shostek, currently a director on the Third Mutual Board and a candidate for Rule 11. I've lived in Laguna Woods for 13 years and served as a Third Mutual Director for the past three. I've lived here long enough to appreciate our incredible community and served long enough to understand the many challenges we face moving forward. The lifestyle, facilities, and programs Laguna Woods offers are unparalleled. However, to continue offering the lifestyle we so enjoy, we must be mindful that as our facilities and infrastructure are aging, maintenance needs are increasing. As treasurer of Third Mutual, I'm acutely aware of the increasing costs associated with that maintenance and the need to find innovative ways to maintain our community while controlling our maintenance costs. As chair of Third's Water Conservation Committee, I'm also keenly aware of the challenges posed by our lack of any natural underground water supply, our need to import virtually 100% of our drinking water, and the high cost of transporting that water over incredibly long distances. In my role as a third mutual director, I've also been active on third's landscape committee, regularly attend Garden Villa Association meetings, and actively participate in the GVA Rec Room Committee. In addition, I also serve on GRF's Finance Committee, as well as its website and purchasing ad hoc committees, and enjoy leading Third Mutual New Resident Orientations when possible. I seek re-election to not only provide continuity as we address our many challenges, but also to be able to continue the work I've begun on special projects, particularly those related to our limited water resources, aging infrastructure, and rising insurance costs. I especially hope to be able to continue in my role as chair of that Third Mutual's Water Conservation Committee. Since I've been voiced efforts, Third's residential water use decreased over 25%, something we all should be proud of. Community involvement and service have always been important to me. In my long career in healthcare as a nurse practitioner, patient-centered care and service were at the heart of practice. Prior to my retirement six years ago, I spent almost nine years as Dean of Health Sciences and Human Services at Saddleback College, where I was very involved in activities all across Orange County. I also served for nine years on the Board of Directors of Saddleback Memorial Medical Center. That position provided valuable experience related to the role of a director on a board of a complex corporation such as ours. If re-elected to the Third Mutual Board, I look forward to continuing to work for our incredible Laguna Woods community as we face the future and its many challenges. Thank you for your consideration of my candidacy. 
Thank you very, very much. Well spoken. Our next candidate, I would like to reintroduce you to Moon Ji Yoon. You have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. All of us came to Laguna Wood to enjoy well-deserved retirement life. Outdoor activities, golf, swimming, even archery, or various clubs like a Chicago club, yoga, travel, music, dancing, you name it, we have it here. Even we pay a little bit more, we like to preserve our lifestyle or even make it a little bit better. Total budget of Laguna Wood is 150 million. Third mutual is about 50 million. A gray-haired couple holding hand in hand after dinner, walking, strolling in neighborhood, waving hand to other couple, say hello to them. 90 years old golfer walking slowly to the green using two golf club as a cane. Theater full of people enjoying Michael Jackson shows. Wow, this is better than Las Vegas. The list goes on and on. To keep this wonderful lifestyle, there are people working very hard behind the scene. Those are people who are making very hard choices and decisions despite the challenging reality like aging, buildings, inflation, even ever-changing laws, new technology, and uh, you name bureaucratic maze, name of few. I'm here to be one of those people chosen. Transparency, a just and a fair mind, intelligence, people skill with a stepping forward attitude are a must quality at the least. During my 50 years medical career as a leader, I navigated successfully through challenging medical politics and all kinds of situations you can ever imagine. As a board member of this body for last one year, I have learned many things and found various multiple challenging on us. To my surprise, I still have my last fire in me to tackle <laughs> these issues and improve this paradise. To add to that, I have scholarship. Director Yoon, your time is up. Can you wrap up your statement, please? All right. That. You, you may continue you, you want to wrap if it up? you would like another 30 seconds or so, doctor. I could. Yes, 30 Thank seconds, you. please. Thank you very much. To add to that, I have a scholarship foundation I found and a charity foundation to serve the community better. Also, I'm about to do go medical mission to Cambodia this September, even during the election year. Thank you. Thank you very much, doctor. And our final candidate this morning, I'll reintroduce you to Jules Zhao. I apologize that, <clears throat> excuse me, that we had to move you. Hope everything's in order now. I enjoyed the move. <laughs> Please proceed. Uh, I, I first wish to um, make a, a formal objection. Uh, this forum has been set up weeks in advance. One would assume that it could have been set up properly so that everybody gets the same choice, uh, the same uh, uh, the equal opportunity. 
Uh, if they say a picture is worth a thousand words, the only people who have actually appeared on the screen so far are Deb and Donna. Um, I'm sure they're perfectly happy to be on screen. I think it's extremely uh, uh, prejudicial to Moon and to Brad and to Andy and even to me that we are not uh, given the same opportunity. Uh, I, I just think that should have been made uh, clear. Uh, perhaps uh, there is a reason uh, why that happened, and uh, my comments uh, perhaps will explain it. Uh, now I'm ready for my time. The sole reason for my candidacy is to make clear that the board's primary fiduciary duty is to the members, not to a corporation, but to the people that populate this great community. Sadly, our current board feels otherwise. I will address that, but first let me talk about this forum. This is a show. It, you, you know, you think you're watching a debate, but it's not really a debate. A real debate addresses current issues, whether to spend $6 million on a security building, whether to remove those silly flashing stop signs, whether our members can still ask staff legitimate questions and not be threatened with frivolous lawsuits. One recent lawsuit was thrown out, but it cost poor Andre Tong a ton of money to defend himself. Oh, and whether members at the most at disciplinary hearings are entitled to the most basic rights we all took for granted before we moved to Laguna Woods Village. But those are questions you're not going to be asked about, right? All staff's questions are retreads. They are questions asked at previous forums years ago. Do you really want to hear answers to questions that were asked four years ago? Not me, because they're not important. What's important is how our members are currently being mistreated by our police department and compliance department, how our constitutional rights are being abridged, and how I propose to remedy the situation. The remedy is simple. We need a member's bill of rights that gives members the same rights that every citizen living outside our gates takes for granted. <clears throat> and you can hasten the day when we adopt it by electing the only four candidates who have committed to voting for the Bill of Rights, Andy, Brad, Moon, and yours truly. Uh, yeah, there are other issues like how much, whether we're paying too much for insurance. Remember last year how I loudly protested that we were buying much too much insurance? Almost $700 million worth because our lawyer said we had to. Well, I proved she was wrong. We finally got rid of that lawyer. I take credit for that personally. And we're now buying just one third of that amount. There are other issues, but I'll limit my time to what's really important. <laughs> so please forgive me if I ignore some of David's questions about landscapes or sewer pipes. I'll answer them after this show is over, but right now I'll focus my real energy on the real problems around here. It's that our current board, all nice people, mind you, is following lousy advice that ignores the most important fiduciary obligation to put members' rights, members' protections, and members' priority first. And I waive the balance of my time. Thank you, Jules. Very interesting. Um, gee, I do have a set of questions. They may be retreads, but I'm going to ask them anyway. And the answers may come out that we're looking for. Okay, and I'm hopeful that you all will pay very close attention to the responses of our candidates. Question number one will go beginning with Deb Allen. Deborah, I'd like to ask you, please, and then we'll go through the other candidates, and then we'll begin with number two. We'll rotate it so there is a semblance of fairness, okay? Hope you're all comfortable with that. I am. Deborah, what do you think are the most crucial, critical issues confronting Third Mutual? Well, I think by listening to the meetings excuse that I have... Me, a, a, excuse me. I really have to jump in here again. If it was unfair to show only Deb and Donna in the introduction, it's doubly unfair to show her answering the first question 
And then the second question, by the time we finish up in an hour and a half, people have, <laughs> will have had a great deal of time to acquaint themselves with Deb Allen, and they're entitled to that, but so is everybody else. So I strongly object to the fact that Deb and Donna continue to be shown full face to everybody in our community that's watching, and the rest of us don't. I think that's just unfair. With all, with all due respect, we're working with the technology we have, okay? It would be nice if we had at least a picture of the other candidates while the audio was showing. However, we, we do not have that. Let me share with you the notion that I believe it is the responsibility also of the members of the mutual, not just... <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> that may be um, a little warning for others of you. I have turned my cell phone off. Thank you, sir. Um, back to where I was. It is the responsibility also of the members of the mutual to find out and to maybe come to meetings and to meet these people face to face. And I apologize on behalf of um, TV6. I apologize on behalf of the people who have put this together, okay? But I would beg you, implore you to pay attention as we move forward. And Jules, your point is very, very well taken. And it's a shame that at least we couldn't have your portrait up here. Your, your headshot, which I happen to have in my collection of headshots. Okay? Let us proceed, please. Yes, Thank you. and all of this time, Deb Allen's portrait has been up, and that's my point. Yes, and, and your point is well taken. We are moving on. Thank you very much. Deborah. if you don't mind, love to see your face. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And Jules, to your objection, I was also cut off at the three-minute mark, where Dr. Moon was allowed 30 seconds beyond his three-minute mark also. So there are some problems in this. Right, form. that was because... But we're just going, we're moving forward, and we're doing the best job we can. So Thank to you. answer your question about the most critical issues that we are facing right now, is I believe that the cost of insurance, and Jules brought this, did bring this up, the cost of insurance does keep rising. And it did concern me. I, I, for 2023... Third was able to purchase $225 million instead of the $675 million that they spent before. But these rates keep rising. And so that is an interest of mine. Um, the aging pipes causing leaks, um, the backups and the manners, that is a concern of mine. And one of the main concerns of mine is as I was walking around before I went to Minnesota, I was walking around and I was speaking to residents and I'd ask them, you know, where are you located? Are you located in United? Are you located in the Mutual? Where are you located? And many of them did not even know this answer. So that really concerns me because if residents don't know which Mutual they're located in, um, they can't watch these presentations and they can't get involved and they can't learn about what we're doing in our community. So I think informing our residents is a high crucial point also. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. The same question will go now to um, Andrew. Andrew, would you like the question repeated? No, I understand it. Thank uh, you. Keeping it real high level, I think the first thing we have to do is keep this place affordable. Now, we differ on the definition of what's affordable, but for most of the residents here, we have to keep this place affordable. So spend the money as if it, it was your own, because it is. Uh, secondly, uh, I think we need to get more money from the outside. We have all these facilities. You know, I come from a corporate world uh, uh, tempered with HOA experience, and I think we need to leverage our assets so that when we have events and uh, programs, we get outside money in. Now, the programs primarily are for the residents, but as often happens, outside people, outside the village are interested we ought to tap into that revenue source. It's a win-win for everybody. The third thing I want to talk about is that we need to get the best deal from GRF and from VMS. And that means a lot of things, but basically it means we're making them work smarter and having more accountability. 
Uh, the other thing I like is uh, the fourth item is uh, welcome. We have a lot of activities and programs. Beginners should be welcome. We were all beginners at one time or whatever we do. And I think the clubs and the other events should recognize that you need to welcome beginners. Additionally, mobility challenge people, of which there are many, and which maybe some of us will be facing. We need to make accommodations so they can partake in all that this great village offers. We need to remove obstacles to beginners and to mobility uh, impaired people. Additionally, uh, I think there's a lack of trust. And in the, uh, Jules touched on it. I don't buy everything he says, but uh, in a, at a very top level, uh, there's some principles of fairness. And I think our village rule uh, process, the compliance and the administration, the discipline needs to be more resident friendly. Thank you. Thank you very much. The question now goes to Brad. Brad, would you like the question repeated? No, I'm fine. Thank you. The, one of the biggest concerns I have heard so far is on controlling costs. Again, I want to reemphasize, I'm opposed to reducing costs through reducing services. You reduce costs through effective bid process, contractor evaluation, and strong management of contracts. My philosophy is you get what you inspect, not what you expect. I'm opposed to reducing the janitorial services for garden terraces. I also uh, was made aware that there is a 10-year plan for pipe replacements in all of the garden buildings. For projects of that duration, we should be hiring our own crews as opposed to outsources and contracting them. Assuming a 30% margin, that could be money in our pockets rather than a contractor's pocket. I also, in my current role, spend over $3 million a year on various insurance coverages for our business. I believe there are opportunities to have adequate coverage without excessive increases. I think we need to work more closely with surrounding communities on how we go out to secure insurance. I think we need to look at going direct as opposed to brokers. I also think there's some opportunities to have a much higher deductible given our reserves that would also reduce our premiums. And I also think we need to look at possibly self-insuring with some form of stopgap coverage. There's lots of opportunities in insurance, and it takes a lot of time and a lot of commitment to finding the right ones, but I think that those opportunities do exist there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next candidate, um, Donna, you have two minutes. Would you like me to repeat the question? No, I think I'm good, and thank you, and I'm happy to keep my camera off and just have my name there because that's okay. the only thing we've got room for, and I'm fine. In terms of our concerns, I've mentioned some of them in my opening statement, but we're talking about our aging infrastructure. There's no way to get around that. Fortunately, or unfortunately, this is a resort. We have a lot of facilities, and the more facilities one has, the more opportunities one has, the more challenging the maintenance of those aging facilities become. So it's important that everybody know and understand that. Surely insurance, we've already mentioned numerous times, and the cost, the rising cost of insurance, regardless of however much insurance one takes out, is a problem for homeowner associations everywhere. Ours being larger, it's a larger issue. Um, the discussion has been held regarding being self-insured. There are a couple of serious problems with that, which has been investigated before, and it would require most likely uh, an assessment, special assessment, which we've never had in this community and would rather not have. But more important is that the insurance we cover gives coverage per occurrence. That means that if there's an issue that requires going to the insurance company, even if it was a massive issue using all our insurance, it would be taken care of. And if a week later there was another major incident that was unrelated to that first one, the insurance would cover it again. Self-insurance wouldn't, we would be starting all over again and paying again. So these are the kinds of things that we learned, you know, in, in being on the board. Certainly, um, environmental issues would be my third area. We've got concern about the environment. I've already mentioned water in my opening statement. 
There was a new um, agreement signed for the Colorado River. California has gotten the lion's share of that water for a very long time. The new agreement's only until 2026, and then it's going to be renegotiated. And so water is a continuing issue, but so is electricity. So is everything. And so the board currently is looking at solar projects and the best way to facilitate time, it. Time. Sorry uh, to interrupt. The waistline relighting is also important. That's it. I'm fine. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. Um, our next candidate um, answering question number one. Would you like the question repeated, Moon? It's your no, turn. that's fine. Okay, yeah. thank you. Please proceed. The biggest challenge currently we have is uh, control the cost, but trying to improve our lifestyle. That's harder to do. We have daunting challenges like inflation, aging buildings and more spending on the water or landscaping. But somehow we have to control the cost so we don't have to price to them, price our residents out, some of them. I don't like to okay. see those people sell their house or condo here and have to move out because they cannot afford. So, that is a very difficult challenging we are facing at this time. And there are several things we could do to do at the third mutual. We are trying to do very hard, but other things is about 20, 30 percent of our budget goes to GRF, which we cannot control GRF. So we like to have a better relationship with the GRF. So GRF will go with us to controlling the cost with us. And uh, <clears throat> we could maintain our lifestyle as it is or better, bring the new technology, bring more resident as our employee pool bring the cost down. There's a lot of cost saving we can do, which we cannot implement with many other tangles around. So we have to solve all those tangles so we can implement those money saving ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Moon. We very much appreciate that. Um, it has just come to my attention that we are operating here <clears throat> Excuse me. We are operating here through Zoom. However, TV6 is able to focus in on the speaker. So those watching at home will have a close-up. Okay? As woman said to Cecil B. DeMille, I'm waiting for my close-up, Mr. DeMille. Okay? As all other of us are. Okay? Our found, finally speaker, Angels, to... Um, Allay your concerns a little bit, which are valid. Um, although we cannot see you here on the monitors, those watching on TV6 will see your smiling face. Okay? <laughs> Would you like the question repeated after all uh, that? No, thank you, David. <laughs> okay, no, let's proceed. thank you, David. Uh, I just made a serious accusation telling you the board is failing to fulfill its primary obligation, which is to protect and enhance the rights of the members. I'll give you some examples. But first, I'm sure anyone you elect will do a creditable job. I mean, we're just a bunch of neighbors come together to do the best we can for our community. No one on the board was trained in city management, which is really our job. So what we mostly do is rubber stamp reports and recommendations of our staff. They're the folks that know how to run things, or at least that's what they're hired to do. So when Kurt recommends we replant the slope to avoid a landslide, I'll defer to his greater knowledge. So anyone you elect is going to vote almost the same way, almost always. But things totally change when the issue is the relationship between the board and the membership. That's an area where staff has no education, training, or competence, or even any interest. I mean, why should a staff member influence what rights we provide our members and what duties our members owe to the community and to each other? No staff member lives here. They don't pay a monthly assessment. They're not subject to our handbook of rules. 
Yet our board follows their dictates in lockstep. And that includes Third's lawyer, whose advice this board follows slavishly. In my two terms as a director, I have never once seen a board reject a single piece of advice our three lawyers ever provided. Despite clear evidence on perhaps a dozen occasions when I proved in writing that they were flatly wrong, that legal advice cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars, wasted money, much of which went into unnecessary legal bills. Thank you. Thank you, Jules. Now we're going to move on to question number two. Andrew will start us off on question number two, which is, what is the most important attribute that a third board member should have? Gee, that could be a lot of things. Uh, the most important attribute, I would think, is due diligence. And that means, yeah, we're, yeah, Jules, we're not experts, but to reach out and get the stuff, learn the things you need to know to a point where you can make an informed decision. Try your best. And that's all you can ask for. We're not experts. We have to rely on experts. The law kind of protects you if you do that. And I think that that's really what we have to do. We, it's like anything you do. If you're going to get something in your home, you're going to get a remodeling. You're not just going to take one person's or one vendor's advice. You're going to shop around. And you're going to get familiar with what you need, what's involved. I think as board members, we have to do that. I personally do. I read everything I get. You wouldn't believe how much stuff we get. I mean, I, literally at home, I'm going to bring it in for shredding. I have a stack of paper almost two feet tall, and that's just since I've been here. There's so much information out there. You have to be uh, careful how you uh, process that information, but I think, again, due diligence is a general, uh, and it's really a, a professional term, I've done it in the corporate world, I'm doing it here in the HOA, and I think we all need to do that. Spend the time, get to know the facts, and make the best decision we can with what we have. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to ask <clears throat> um, Brad the same question. Um, if you would be so kind, would you like the question repeated? Uh, no, I'm fine, thank you. Um, first off, what I would, I've been involved in a variety of different boards over time. And I think constructing a board is the same as constructing a management team. What I try and do is I would try and put together as diverse a group of backgrounds as I possibly could. People with backgrounds in construction, uh, healthcare, um, a variety of different backgrounds. Because I think what you find when you do that is you get a lot of different ideas and a lot of different um, thinking. You don't want to have nine people with the exact same background giving you the exact same answer. I think that the diversity of thought is incredibly important. Um, so that's one of the things I would look at um, as I cast a vote as a, as a good diversity of background and experiences so that it helps round out the board. Um, the other thing is I, I think that this is an aging community, obviously. This infrastructure is going to need a lot of money over the next, well, 10 to 20 years. So I think that, you know, I'm sure that things have been looked at in the past. I'm sure that, as Jules says, lawyers have uh, given recommendations. I can tell you I deal with lawyers every single day. And I can tell you that lawyers advise, they don't decide. And that's a very important distinction that I think that needs to come through here. Um, I, think that, uh, I think that the opportunity here is excellent. Um, to continue our lifestyle and to control our costs and still get more services for what our spend is. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Um, I'd like to pass the question on what is the most important attribute that a third board member should have to Donna. Donna, hello again. Thank you for turning off your... <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. And in terms of the most important attribute, there's an attribute everyone who volunteers for the board has, 
and that's a sense of service. We are a volunteer board, so that's understood. But I think one of the most difficult things, and therefore an important attribute, is making decisions for the for the greater community to do that. We always listen to the individual and help them when and where we can. But at times it's necessary to make a decision for the whole community. We have 6,102 manners in Third Mutual. And that means an awful lot of members who need the help, the board and the support. So I think that in terms of the most important attribute, this ability to see the broad picture, focus on the best for the most people, but also still be able to reserve that ability to listen to the individual and where we can um, do the best for them as well. Thank you. And the same question to Dr. Moon. Um, would you like the question repeated? No, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think, <clears throat> let me say one example. Uh, informed resident is very important to me. And uh, last uh, few the <clears throat> financial committee, due to somehow insurance, we had about uh, near the one million surplus or windfall for happen in year 2022, and uh, so we were told that there were two options we can do. One is we can return that to the resident, which I calculate about 150 bucks for each resident, or we can transfer that to the following years of uh, only for reserve fund. And so we voted to transfer to following year. I abstained, I'm the only one abstained because I thought the resident, it's a resident money, resident should be informed and they have to have some voice in it. But somehow, to my mind, they did not have any those privileged information at all. And the finance director told me the open meeting was just enough for legally requirement. But I told we have fiduciary duty, ethically, morally, to inform the resident, so let the resident choose it. So the resident was not involved at all in that decision. It was pretty sad to me. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your explanation. And Jules, it's your turn, please. Would you like the question repeated? No, thank you. Here's how the board violates its fiduciary obligations. By turning over governing functions to security and compliance, our staff, and to our lawyer. <laughs> But they're our employees. We shouldn't be taking orders from them. As Brad said, that's our job. The result has been a reign of terror that violates common sense and constitutional rights. And the worst part is that most of it occurs in private at closed disciplinary hearings conducted by compliance, where only the, the only record made is what they say took place. They recently dropped the prosecution of me after I demanded a public hearing. It's authorized by Davis Sterling. But I'm a lawyer, I could protect myself. Most members have no idea they can demand a public hanging, a, a public hearing. <laughs> um, you know, want some examples? Most evidence is just a sheet of paper containing hearsay evidence. How do you cross-examine a sheet of paper? Are you finished, Jules? No, no, no. Okay. Members have no right to face their accusers or even know their identity. But the disciplinary panel knows because compliance sends them all that information before the hearing and shows the member only some of that evidence. Compliance brings in witnesses sometimes only after the witness is excused. So the witness, the member, never gets to see the secret evidence. Members are convicted for violating non-existing rules. 
Compliance outright lies to the board. They once urged affirmance of a conviction that had previously been reversed. This is terrible stuff. We have to change it, and we have the ability to change it by voting for the four people that will vote for a member agenda, a member-centric agenda. Brad, Moon, Andy, and yours truly. Thank you. Thank you. And going back to the beginning again, Deborah, it's your turn, please, to answer question number two. Oh, thank you so very much. I think that loyalty is so very, very important. I think that Donna kind of touched on this a little bit. Um, when you go into those meetings, you have to take off your homeowner's hat. You have to put on that director's hat. You have to take the interests of the association and the members above your personal interests. Um, and an example of this is Stuart Hack recently sent me an email and he asked me, he said, so what is your opinion of the third story in the cleaning? And to be honest, I'm not the type of gal that tells you what you want to hear to be able to get your vote. I'm the type of person that gathers facts. I analyze things. I strategically look at things to come to an answer. So my response to Stuart was, um, I personally think that the cleaning is not necessary to be done four times. But I said, as a building captain, being in Minnesota, I had Meg, my co-captain, go around and ask the residents of our building what their thoughts were. And their thoughts were that they, yes, they wanted to have the cleanings done every week. So I went above my own personal opinion of this, and I was able to say to Stuart, so this is the decision that came from my building. Um, I've listened to the budget reports, and, and that's kind of where I came to my conclusions about the third building. And I, I realize that we're under such a tight budget. But uh, once again, I, I listen to what the residents want, and I take this into consideration. I need to have that loyalty piece. Thank you, Deborah. We are going to move on now to question number three, and we are going to rotate. So Brad will begin question number three, which is, what does the term due diligence mean to you as a third board member? Thank you. Um, due diligence is uh, making sure that everything that is supposed to get done gets done. You know, when uh, Jules talked a little bit about fiduciary responsibility, obviously as a board member, you have a responsibility to the entire uh, customer base, all the residents. So part of the due diligence um, involves fiduciary responsibility and making sure that, you know, even as Deb said, you may not personally agree with a specific thing, but if it's for the better of the community and you know that that's what the community really wants done, then I think that you need to be supportive of that. Um, the other part of due diligence is, uh, goes back to what I said earlier. I think you get what you inspect, not what you expect. That includes financials, that includes auditing, that includes contracting, that includes landscaping. You know, I have a dog and I walk the dog twice a day and I walk through a variety of our neighborhoods. And I can see when landscaping goes through, they've done a great job of cutting the grass, except for five or six places where they didn't. Um, I see sprinklers, sprinkler heads spraying water where there's no plants. I see exposed pipe from sprinklers, which will degrade over time and start to leak. So I think that the, the other part of due diligence is attention to detail. If a job needs to be done, it needs to be done right, whether that's taking out the garbage or whether that's installing a pipe or whether that's replacing a roof. All that stuff needs to be inspected. It just doesn't need to be contracted. So I think that the due diligence really goes back to making sure that everything gets done that you're paid for and make sure it gets done right. Thank you, Brad. Um, turn this question over now to Donna. Would you like the question repeated? No, I'm fine. Thank due you. Diligence. Due diligence says you need to do your homework. You need to explore the answers before you give one, the, the question thoroughly. Um, for example, the insurance has been mentioned so many times today. Our CCNR say we have to have full coverage if we can obtain it. We couldn't obtain it. Once we couldn't obtain full coverage, we did our due diligence, had our insurance companies find out what do they feel 
is really the most appropriate amount to insure us for. We looked at every possibility and then reached a conclusion of what would be the best. And so your due diligence means before you answer, find out, prepare yourself, get as knowledgeable about whatever the issue is as you can, and then act and respond accordingly. Thank you very much. I'd now like to direct the question to Moon. Thank you. <clears throat> due diligence sounds like a very legal term. We do follow a lot of due diligence here. Whenever we make any resolution, we go through about three, four committees and then finally both make that decision. But that's not enough to me. Our fiduciary duty should be rest on the resident, not just the legal term. We have to go beyond the legal term and we have to find ourselves in the resident shoes. Morally, ethically, do we serve the, to the resident? When I was told our duty as a board member is for the cooperation, I was shocked. Our at least my responsibility, fiduciary duty, is to the resident, not the corporation. Corporation is made of by the resident, and it is for the resident. And uh, if we serve for the corporation only, we are missing a lot of uh, big mess. Lincoln never said of the nation by the nation, for the nation. He said, of the people, by the people, for the people. So I'm saying again, this due diligence, our responsibility stays to the resident, by the resident, for the resident, of the resident. Thank you. Thank you. Jules? Is that really a question that will, you will use, the answers to which you're going to use to determine who you want to vote for? Does that, do our answers actually distinguish between what Brad and what Andy and what Moon think about due diligence? That's ridiculous. We all feel the same way. Everybody knows what due diligence is. I just mentioned a few of the many outrageous acts that compliance regularly commits. This is important. It's pretty crazy, huh? Of course, not one of the things I have mentioned would ever be allowed in any court, in any municipal court in the country. So how do we correct all these vile violations? It's really quite simple. The board must really start doing its job and take control of an out-of-control policing and prosecuting regimen. We desperately need a member-centric agenda, one that places members' interests above all else. I drafted a Bill of Rights that does just that, but our current board flatly rejects it, influenced, I believe, by a lawyer who apparently thinks that protecting members' rights violates our fiduciary obligation to the corporation. That's ridiculous. Can you believe that you elect us to represent your interests, but as soon as we get on the board, your interests are no longer our primary concern? That's nonsense. Hey, I've fought with thirds board's lawyers many times, and I was proven right, I believe, each time. You could see it on my blog. Now I challenge thirds current lawyer to debate this issue in public. Let the membership decide who the board owes its fiduciary duty to. Want to bet who's going to win? But you can resolve the issue without another debate. You can tell the board loudly and clearly that you agree with me. And if you do so, please elect the only four candidates that stand for a member-centric a member centric agenda, and that will vote for a Bill of Rights that frank finally buries this currently illegal and frankly nauseating disciplinary procedure we live under. You can elect the Bill of Rights slate, Andy, Brad, Moon, and yours truly. Thank you. 
Thank you. Question number three, Deborah. Would you like me to repeat the question? No, I've got the answer here. Thank um, you. So, thank you. So when teaching corporate law to paralegals, we cover the topic of due diligence and fiduciary responsibilities. And then we, we cover how corporations come together and how to terminate corporations and, and all, everything about corporations. When I talk about due diligence to my paralegals, I talk about taking reasonable steps. You wanna make sure that you're not taking any risky steps. You, you don't wanna make poor decisions. You don't want to pay too much. You don't want to break any rules or regulations. And, and a great example of this is as I was following GRF, and some of the residents were upset because GRF was losing some money that was invested. And GRF did their due diligence. They, they listened to the experts. They left that bond money in, and now it's coming around again. They listened to the data. They looked to the facts. They look at legal, professional, they want that advice to make the correct decisions. And if you want to take it down a step for directors, it means that we need to, we have to read the agenda. We have to look at our accompanying documents. We need to know what we're discussing before we actually step into that meeting. We need to know what we're talking about so that we can make proper decisions for our members. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, uh, for question number three, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, in the corporate world, I sure the hell know what due diligence is. If I didn't do it, I could get sued. Never got sued. I always felt comfortable in the decisions I made in the corporate world. When I got involved with HOAs and community associations, uh, the standard's different, and it's basically you have uh, people that aren't experts, that aren't even trained in the field. And like I said before, you have to make an informed decision. So the onus is on you to meet some standard. And for me, I have a pretty, have a pretty high personal standard because again, I had this corporate background. And the thing is, in addition to hard items, you need to listen to the people. Now, you need also be able to separate uh, you know, somebody complaining versus constructive ideas. I love constructive ideas. And I use that in my evaluation, uh, try to be fair. But again, you have to be informed. Uh, and I would say that you need to ask the right questions. Not just ask questions, but the right questions. And that means that you can't be lazy in your thinking. You have to focus on what's important, get informed about it, ask the right questions so that you become comfortable with your decision. And personally, I don't follow blindly. Uh, I'm not a rubber stamper. So uh, I hope that gives you a vision or an understanding of how I operate. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now it is time, I believe, to move on to question number four which is what is meant by fiduciary responsibilities and how are third board members expected to fulfill them? And this time we're going to begin with Donna, if you please. If you could repeat the question, there was some noise interference outside just a moment. Of, of course, we're on question number four. Yeah. What is meant by um, fiduciary responsibilities and how are third board members expected to fulfill them? In the traditional sense, when we think of fiduciary responsibility, we're thinking financial and clearly there's a very large financial responsibility, but it goes beyond that for a board. Any board is always defined as their, their primary their primary goal, their primary objective is their fiduciary responsibility. It isn't always just the money. The money is absolutely critical, but it's also the responsibility to that community to maintain our facilities in as best we can and to keep the expenses down. Yeah, using innovative strategies so that we can do those things. The fiduciary responsibility is that not just the financial responsibility, 
but the responsibility to the community as a whole to maintain it at the highest possible level, the highest possible quality of life for the members and to serve the community in that way. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'd like to direct the question to Moon. Would you like the question repeated? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Fiduciary responsibility. We got elected by resident. The resident put up the money, nobody else, to the third mutual. So our responsibility should be rested on the resident, not the corporation. Corporation are made up by resident. If a corporation are made not for the resident, just the corporation itself, there's something greatly wrong. Resident is the element of a whole community. And uh, if we don't serve, we don't have fiduciary responsibility to the resident, I'm not here today. Not only legally, we have to go well beyond ethical, moral responsibility to them. Like we can decrease the old red tape. We've been keep adding red tape. And for instance, if they want to do some kind of remodeling, they have to go through alteration here, HOA. And then after that, they have to go to city. Why don't they? City are made of 90% of the Laguna wood. Why don't we put them together? And if we cannot put them together, there is something, rest of them, but most of them we can put it together. Let's let the resident have less stress. Thank you. Thank you. Jules, it's your nickel. This is just another classically irrelevant question. Is there any question here about how anyone on this board, anyone on this panel, anyone who's ever been on a third board panel questioning their fiduciary duty? We're just a bunch, I said this before, we're just a bunch of neighbors that come together to make the best decisions we can for our community. There is not an ounce of difference between Moon and Brad, and Andy, and me, and Donna, and Deb, or anybody else. We all want to do the best we can for the community. I've never seen anyone accused of actually affirmatively uh, you know, working to the detriment of our neighborhood, of our community, of our board. So this is a silly question. This is just a way of making believe we're really, you're really seeing a debate. But there's not a debate because we haven't talked about the real issues, or at least the questions don't ask us to talk about the real issues. I don't have any question. I would put my trust and my life in the hands of any of these people. I'm sure they'd be terrific. The fact that they volunteered, the simple fact that they volunteered says all you need to know about it. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Deborah, you have two minutes, please. Would you like the question repeated? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Great. So in my corporate law classes, we talk about fiduciary responsibilities, too. And we, we talk about the duty of care and loyalty and good faith, confidentiality, prudence. And examples of this would be um, duty of care to make sure that we attend, we participate in meetings. We have to be informed to be able to make decisions. We have to make reasonable inquiries. We make our decisions based on facts from the staff, our legal counsel, our consultants. Um, the loyalty, I mentioned a little bit in my other answer, putting on that homeowner's hat and putting on the director, taking off that homeowner's hat and putting on the director's hat, putting our interests above, our personal interests above everything else. Um, 
we we should be passionate constructively. We debate issues. We shouldn't try to undermine the, the decisions that come from the board. When you leave a board room, you leave as it was the decision of the board. Confidentiality, we remain uh, confidential after leaving the board because there are some consequences that can come up if we breach that confidentiality. And prudence that we use good judgment in our use of resources. So once again, our sole, sole focus is on the members and we have to make full disclosure to our residents. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. And Andrew, if you would be so kind as to address question number four. Okay, thank you. Davis Sterling, that's, this is a uh, California law that I think came into effect 2013, 2014 uh, to address a number of abuses. And so the law in addressing those abuses concentrated on the 5% of the, the bad situations and then made the 95% of the okay situations have to live with it. So there's a legal framework that David Sterling requires for fiduciary responsibility. That's one thing. And as directors, we all sign a, we actually sign a form saying we'll be in compliance with that. But in the real world, there's this thing, and I'm gonna use a 50 cent term, it's called cognitive dissonance. You believe one thing, but the facts kind of eat at you and say, no, there's something else going on. And I think what we need to do to do, to do our fiduciary responsibility properly is to get the corporation, third mutual, on the same page as the residents. Again, in the end, we're, we're all for the residents, and it, it's a form thing. Um, cognitive dissonance, what the corporation is doing doesn't seem right. We have an obligation for it to seem right. And so what I'm saying is we want to get the corporation, fiduciarily speaking, on the same page as the residents. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. And Brad, last one for this question. Would you care to have it repeated? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you. As a current chief executive officer, I am very familiar with fiduciary responsibility. I sign everything. Everything that goes to the SEC has my name on it. So I completely understand the financial and the legal responsibilities of fiduciary responsibility. It's not something that I um, take lightly. And I make sure that I have all the information available so that when I sign something, it's correct. It's pretty much that simple. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we're going to move on now to question number five. And we're going to begin with Dr. Yoon. Dr. Yoon, the question is, on what boards and committees have you served and in what capacities? Did you ever chair a board? Were you an officer of a board? Thank you. Throughout my 50 years of medical career, I formed, I served many communities, many organizations, and uh, I served as a president, as a member of a board, and uh, you name it, in any medical field, I did that. I formed the two independent uh, physicians association. Who is not familiar with that is, physician cannot make union. So to fight against uh, the insurance company, to negotiate with the insurance, abusive uh, their price. We had formed the Independent Physicians Association so we can negotiate with the insurance company. And uh, I formed in 1985 the first one, which is a very early one. And then 1998, I formed the second one and we were very successful negotiated with the uh, insurance company and we benefited a great deal with all the, our members. Also, I served at the joint venture committee with the hospital and uh, we made a lot of purchase joint ventures 
and uh, served for the hospital as well as the physicians. We brought many new services and uh, new equipment to the community. Thank you. Thank you. And Jules, question number five, would you care to have it repeated? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was a founding director of Pete Seeger's Hudson River Sloop Restoration, the Clearwater, the boat that now travels up and down the Hudson River uh, giving concerts and uh, arguing for uh, environmental concerns. Uh, I was Pete's lawyer at that time. Uh, I was a member of the Publishing Industries Task Force that negotiated the fair use exception to the new 1978 <coughs> Copyright Act. Uh, so I've had a number of, um, you know, formal uh, uh, positions as director and member. Uh, I have been a, a very active member of the uh, Landscape Committee here, uh, the Water Commission, uh, the, the Water Committee, uh, as a member of the, um, as a member of the Landscape Committee. I visited six different communities. I interviewed world famous uh, uh, landscape designers. I actually uh, was able to get uh, uh, Ken, uh, Ken Smith from New York City to actually drive down from Los Angeles to spend the whole afternoon with our landscape department to talk about uh, the landscape committee, to talk about um, uh, 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 turf conversion, uh, which is something we don't do enough of, uh, but we're trying and uh, we really have to do more of that. Uh, I think that's about it. Thank you, David. Thank you. And we're going to refer to um, Deborah next. Deborah, would you need to have the question repeated? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm currently serving on the BMS board. I'm on the, um, I'm the GBA building captain. I'm serving on the Laguna Country United Methodist Church on their financial board. In the past, in my academic world, I served as a chair for an online committee um, that focused on putting online courses on our campus. I was on a technology academic committee, a new campus academic technology team, a new programs committee that generated new programs for the college, a student life committee that looked at budgets as to how to have events on our campus. I implemented a food pantry and had a food pantry committee on my campus. I was part of the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee. I was part of the Faculty Development Committee. I was part of a task force that helped our college prepare for academic visits from the HLC, the Higher Learning Commission. I was on an assessment committee, a marketing committee, a faculty shared governance committee, and I was part of our department chairs. So I was quite active in my academic world in making decisions for my college. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd like to now to refer to Andrew. Thank you. Uh, been on a lot of boards and commissions. Uh, for example, most recently here. And there's nothing like being on a board to find out how things are. And things aren't as they seem, and you have to adjust for it. You have to work with people. You get to know people. So there's a process to being a board member, and I've learned that process, believe me. Prior to this, I was in, a, in an HOA in Costa Mesa for eight years, several of those as president. Really troubled with issues. We had, even had a rogue board member, and believe me, I got to know Davis Sterling in spades. <laughs> uh, in the end, that board member was gone for valid reasons, a lot of legal expenses saved. That board member had actually retained an attorney, so it was really a difficult situation. Before that, I'd been on several civic boards and some local neighborhood associations, but this is back in Chicago, and we're talking associations there because it's a big city, 10,000 people, 15,000 people. In one, uh, actually in two situations, one of them I was on the O'Hare Noise Compatibility Commission, and I lobbied effectively for my ward uh, to get the airplanes away from us. Terrible. Uh, Additionally, in Chicago, uh, when there's a thing called a Community Alternative Policing Strategy, CAPS, 
I was in on the uh, outset of it, getting it implemented, and I became vice chairman of that commission. Now, the ward uh, position represented 52,000 people. So I'm used to hearing people, and I'm used to hearing the differing opinions and reconciling that. I've also consulted as a pro bono consultant for a lot of boards for charities and not-for-profits, and that's really what we are. So I think I'm well prepared with my board service. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Brad, care to give it a go? I'm going to need more than two minutes. <laughs> um, I worked for Essilor of America for 10 years. Their business model was to buy 80% of an existing business, and the people they bought it from would maintain 20%. So I was the chairman of the board for 20 of those companies. They were located all across the United States. I was on the board of the West Point Society of Southern Nevada for several years. I was on the board of an HOA in Las Vegas, which I already mentioned. Um, in an LLC format, it's not a board, it's called a um, managing member. My wife and I started and owned a cheer and dance company in Southern California between 2003 and 2007. I was a managing member of that. I also currently own an optical lab which produces eyeglasses in Las Vegas. I'm also the, was the managing member of that until I moved here. I also owned a man, manufacturing company that produced above ground pools and accessories in Toronto, Canada. I was on a board of directors with that. And I've um, also on the uh, board of directors for the Red Grange Bowl. It's a junior college bowl um, that's hosted by the College of DuPage in, outside of Chicago. My father worked there for 30 years. So I've been involved on that bowl committee as well. And I'm also on the current board of the companies that I run. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Brad. And Donna, we'll finish up question number five with Donna. Very good. Thank you. Um, as I already mentioned in my opening statement, I'm currently treasurer of Third Mutual and also chair of Third's Water Conservation Committee. Served on and am currently serving on Third's Landscape Committee, the GVA Rec Room Committee, and GRF's Finance Committee, to name just a few. In my career, as a dean, I was on numerous committees on the community college, and Saddleback is a very large community college. I also have spent many years teaching in higher education at universities where I had to serve again and was happy to serve on several committees. And I think that my exp current experience probably will have to speak for itself but it's been a long career of service and serving on committees and communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's time to move on now to question number six, which is describe how you might handle a resident's complaint as a third board director. Can't imagine that. Jules, we'll begin with you, please. Well, I guess it really depends on what the problem is. Uh, most of the time, I mean, we are, our board is set up, we have a number of standing committees. Uh, so if a particular problem is in the province of a particular committee, the proper place to send the member is to introduce the member to the head of the committee and suggest that that's where the area, that that's where the, the, the problem uh, should be initially discussed. Uh, if this is something that's unique, uh, you know, if it's, and if it's something that really is, has a more universal, uh, a, a, a universal uh, effect, uh, I, uh, I guess it really depends on what the issue is. But I don't think there's anything wrong with a member contacting uh, several other board members and discussing it among themselves to determine how it should be handled. Probably, if it becomes a serious enough matter, the board's going to determine which committee handles it. But this really, uh, it really just depends on, on what the issue is. Uh, there's no one-size-fits-all uh, answer. And that's my answer. Thank you, Jules. Um, Deborah? Hi. Um on the BMS board, I come across this quite often. Um, I have residents that do come to me with issues. And first, I, I 
tell them to go to resident services and try and resolve their issues at resident services. I tell them to either um, talk to the person and get that number that they can get to cross-reference it again if they ever have to cross-reference that number. And then if that still is not resolved, then I reach out to the appropriate person that can help them take care of their issues. An example would be uh, one of the residents um, that lived in United actually uh, uh, purchased her own appliances and then she was waiting for a rebate check to come back and she wasn't getting it and I told her to go to resident services and had her document things. And then I, I reached out to Catherine there at VMS and um, eventually got this resolved. She did get her rebate check. Another issue was another resident had a water intrusion issue. And once again, I said, go to resident services. It didn't get resolved. And so then I, I, I was able to reach out to the appropriate person to be able to get that taken care of. I think one of the joys of working on VMS is I have gotten to know the people that work at VMS and get to know what their duties are and what they take care of. So it allows me to be able to go to the appropriate person to be able to resolve things for our residents. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. And now I'm gonna refer this question to Andrew, if you please. Thank you. I think every resident has a right to have the ear of the board members that represent them. Uh, now, Davis Sterling, and believe me, I know Davis Sterling, puts a lot of limits on how we can interact with residents. Still, we ought to go out of our way to hear people and especially to listen to them. Is there something to this? But again, uh, you want to verify. You have to do due diligence on their complaints or whatever it is, or their comments. You need to check out what's really involved. And then when that, once that's the case, you need to try to satisfy the resident. But I gotta tell you, you know, coming from Chicago, and I know I sound like a local, but I'm from Chicago, and I gotta tell you that the system there, clout, somebody who is in the know or knows people takes care of you. I don't believe that. I believe the system ought to take care of it. We need to have the right system so that people don't have to get special intervention. Now mistakes are made. Things happen. We need to address those as specific issues, but if it's a generic systemic issue, as board members, we need to fix that so that the process takes care of most of these. Mistakes are gonna be made. We correct the mistakes. The important thing is we learn from the mistakes and in the future, it doesn't happen again. So that's how I handle residents' comments. Listen, get informed on it, take care of it initially. Again, within the province that the process eventually ought to take care of it, although attention might be needed in a specific case, and then you improve the whole uh, system. Thank you. Thank you. Good timing. And now, Brad, would you be so kind as to address question number six? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I've heard a lot about the issue of compliance. Um, and really, it kind of kind of takes me back to thinking about uh, my experience at West Point. The honor code there was you will not lie, cheat, or steal, or tolerate those who do. And there was an honor committee and a process that would investigate and rule on every single honor violation. It was formed and managed by cadets. So when I look at compliance here, my first thought is that the compliance issues should be managed by residents, not by an outside entity, even if it's uh, you know the management staff. You can't have 20,000 people living together and not have issues. I mean, especially when you have 20,000 older people living together. Um, and I've already had a single run-in with compliance. It wasn't a run-in, it was a question, and it worked out fine. But I think that, um, I think that the member-centric idea is important. I think that needs to be incorporated into the compliance process. And I think it needs to be self-administered by residents. And I think any appeals should come up to the um, board of directors. And I think that the professional staff should stay out of that. We should be managing that ourselves. We live together. We have to suffer the consequences of mistakes. Um, so we should, we should manage that ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brad. And Donna, 
it's your turn, please. Would you like the question, okay, please? Okay, thank you. No, I'm fine. Thank you. As a board member, it's, can you hear me? Can yes. you hear me? Yes. Hello? Um, oh, okay, we, great. we can hear um, you. As, as, a, as a board member, I get a certain amount of questions directed personally to me, and sometimes it's just a how do I question. And so, of course, I help explain the process to them because the process usually moves much faster if they take the most direct steps. And as you heard, resident services is always the first one. And they have the, that's the chain of command. They have the pathway to the department that would answer it. Sometimes it's a very special problem that's a little bit different. Donna, and in I, that case, I listen to the problem and help kind of direct the path for them so that they know the steps to follow. And, Donna, I'm sorry, we cannot and, hear you. We, can, we cannot hear you properly. We can hear you. Um, would you and care? approach the chair of the appropriate committee who, yeah. who has direct okay. contact? Now you can't hear us. <laughs> okay. I, I'm sorry, Donna, can you okay. hear us? With the folks who actually okay. do the work. It's, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, we're going to have to cut. We're going to have to Sometimes cut you off. It's Something that is yeah, can start so over. special. Um, we're, we hope we can resolve the issue. If not, um, perhaps by the time we're ready for our um, final comments, that you may address this question at that time. Okay. Want to be fair. Okay. But unfortunately, at this point, we cannot hear you. Okay. So, Moon, I'm going to. Um, I'm going to have her, she's yes, going to log Paul. back on again, just to FYI. She's I'm sorry? Gonna, she's going to log back on to a different account. Just going to give you a heads up. On Fine, that. just just let us know. Yeah. I'm going to keep going. Yeah. Okay. Moon, would you address that question, please? Yeah. Thank you. We have uh, two years. So whenever the resident complain to us, they are very, very frustrated. I'm pretty sure they went through all that hassle. And then they are frustrated and uh, they are coming to us. And uh, so first thing I'll do, I'm going to listen to them. And then second, I'll find the fact. And then that I can help them or some of them, they are just venting out. So just listening to them was enough for them. But anyhow, as a board member, we are not executing body. We are decision-making body. So whenever we trying to help them, we have to go to BMS people, BMS directors, somebody over there. And uh, if it's a, oh, excuse me, if it's a neighborhood issue, like uh, noise from upstairs or a cat or something, I would like to set up some kind of neighborhood or mediator board or advisory something so they can solve among themselves. If they cannot solve it, then we still have to bring it to us and we have to make something and make them happy to them. But most of them, they, when they come to us, they are very frustrated. We got to help them. And uh, our system is, as a board member, we are not decision maker. Sometimes certain rules we cannot change because they follow the rule. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have Donna back? Uh, currently, she is not back on yet. So. Um... Okay. Skip to the next question, and we can wait for her later. Okay. On. Um, we've come. 
Um, we have six candidates and seven questions, so that brings us back to the beginning. Um, question number seven is, what do you do when the third board votes yes and you vote no on an issue that you care about? And we're right back to the beginning. Deborah, we're beginning with you again. So if the board decides to vote yes and and I decide that I do not agree with what they agree with, is the question? That's correct. So this has happened to me on the VMS board. And I have to vote the way I want to vote. But when I walk away from that board meeting, we are a board. We are not individuals. We are a board making these decisions. And so we have to come out with a united front and be able to go with that decision, you know, and, and be able to walk past that decision. And like I said, I, I've seen this happen before on the BMS board and, and it actually is okay with me. I mean, if I don't agree with my fellow board members, it's fine. I can come to that conclusion and I can agree and I can walk away as a board decision. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to um, for that question to Andrew, please. Thank you. It happens. And uh, to quote a famous movie, what we have here is a failure to communicate. So I believe one thing, the majority believes the other thing. I need to understand them better. They need to understand me better. I need to do my homework. And if I'm really passionate about something, I need to communicate the benefits that I voted for to them. In the end, though, the way we operate, otherwise we'd have chaos, the majority rules. So those are the rules. So as a director, do your homework, uh, educate the others, but also get educated yourself. I've been wrong, you know, and when I find out that I'm wrong, okay. I correct myself and we move on. So I think it's important that you understand why things get voted yes and you vote no. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Brad, question number seven, please. Well, I think when I go back to what I said earlier, you want a diversity of thought on your board. Um, the reason there's an odd number on boards is because you're never going to get consensus on every single issue every single time. And the way I feel about it is if I can't influence the other board members um, so that they understand my way of thinking and vote with me, then that's my problem, not theirs. So I agree with uh, Deb in that when you walk out, the decision is a board decision. It's not an individual decision, and I would be fully supportive of um, whichever way the board votes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Donna. Are we back with Donna or not? She's on the phone right now, so I'm, I'm trying to get her to unmute. Okay. Donna, can you hear us? I think the internet shuts off at noon in Minnesota, right, yeah. so I'm not really sure <laughs> to get it back. I, no, this, I think she's what, in Indiana, I believe. Yeah, what month is it? Um, I'm going to move on then. Okay. Okay. And we'll give Donna some catch up time if we are able to communicate with her. Okay. Uh, Moon? Uh, thank you. This is a democratic society. Everybody has a different view. That's why we are running by majority rules. When board decides something against uh, what I believe, I will argue, I'll try to persuade at the board meeting, but not every time I'm going to be successful. So does everybody else. Once the board made the decision, we all have to follow. But I will try to, coming back to them again, in some other way, find more fact trying to persuade them so we can bring the fact back again if it is such important. If it isn't, then I'll just uh, let it go. And um, people whose 
going against that decision, I'm trying to persuade them as my own decision. This is a democratic society. You have to abide by the rule we made, even if you like it or not like it. When board make that decision, this is our decision, including myself who vote against it or abstain it. But it is our decision we have to abide by until it changed again. Thank you. Thank you, Moon. And Jules, question number seven, please. Why don't you repeat it? I'd like to repeat it. <laughs> see, see, I knew if I didn't ask. <laughs> what would you do when the board, third board votes yes and you vote no on an issue that you care about? Uh, I would and I do support the actions of the board, but that doesn't mean I have to button my lip. The point is that I am running for re-election. And the reason I'm running for re-election is because I have some ideas that I feel passionate about. And that is that I believe the members are right now being treated royally badly. And if I can't make the statement that what the board is doing by not adopting a more member-centric agenda, if I can't say that, then why am I running? The point is that I have strong feelings about, and I have the right, in fact, I think I have, a, a, I have an honorable duty to tell people what I think is wrong. And that, so this is really, this is a loaded question. This is like all the other questions they've had. Do you really care? Are you gonna make a decision on who you're gonna vote for because of how we define the duty of loyalty or fiduciary duty or what it means to do due diligence? These are silly questions and I don't wanna have silly answers. So take me as I am or let me be, thank you. Thank you, Jules. Um, do we have Donna? She's having issues, but just give me one second. I'm going to attempt to call her. Um, give me a second. Okay. Donna, yeah. can you hear us? Yeah. I can. Okay, here we go. We're good now. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back to question number six because that was where we had the difficulty in hearing you. Question number six says, describe how you might handle a resident's complaint as a third board director. Would you care to address that, please? Yes, um, and I answered, but you, you couldn't hear me. We could not hear and, you, so if you'd like to begin from the beginning, that yeah, would be useful. And, Thank you. Yeah, I'm getting feedback here, so it's a problem. But I, I get requests from members on a regular basis, and sometimes it's as simple as, how do I? And if that's it, I kind of steer them in the right direction. If it's a special request that has special circumstances, I try and guide them through, but most often directing them to resident services is most effective because it's the most direct route. Okay, and we could not hear you for question number seven, so I'm going to ask you to comment on that, please. Here's the question. <clears throat> what do you do when a third board member votes yes or the third board votes yes and you vote no on an issue that you care about. If the if the vote carry, the board decision of the board is decision. and in most boards you speak with one voice. Okay, um, we're not having uh, much luck with that, but I'm going to repeat your last comment. As a board, you speak with one voice. Okay. 
Um, and I apologize that we cannot connect with you. We'll see if we can reconnect so you may have an opportunity for a closing statement. But before that, we need to get to questions from the audience, nope. if there are any. Yeah, we're, we're, we don't have time. We have to have okay. a closing statement. We have to move on then. Okay. <laughs> that, that could be the most interesting part. However, um, in the essence of time, I'd like to give everyone on the, um, of, the, of our candidates an opportunity for a closing statement. And again, we will, in fairness, reverse our way that we did this originally. Okay. So each candidate has two minutes, okay? And we're going to begin this time with Jules. And we'll work backwards. Thank you, David. As I said, anyone you elect will do a creditable job. Remember, we're just a bunch of neighbors come together to do what we think is best for the community. We've no training in city management, so you shouldn't expect us to be competent managers. We hire professionals to advise us, at least when we're talking about maintaining our physical plant, our hardware, our roads, buildings, landscape, rec facilities, craft studios. But if you care about our software, about how we treat each other, how we want to rule ourselves, whether we want to rule ourselves, because right now we're really not ruling ourselves, right? Then ask yourself a simple question. Should we tolerate a system that allows compliance to seek confiscatory fines for a clutter violation? Should we tolerate the concept of holding heavy fines in abeyance pending good behavior? <laughs> Behave or else? Should we give untrained folks half our age who don't live here, don't pay assessments, don't know our, our priorities, and don't really care, folks who regularly lie, should we continue to give them the power to tyrannize our members without proper restraints? To me, it's a no-brainer. Our primary interest must be the individual member at all times. If you feel otherwise, don't vote for me, but I hope you will vote for me, and I hope you'll also vote for Andy, for Brad, and for Moon. Together with like-minded folks currently on the board, we will rid ourselves of that police state mentality and assure a more nurturing environment for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Jules. And um, Moon, I'd like to allow you a couple minutes to share your closing thoughts. Thank you, Joel. You keep saying vote for me Andy and Brett, thank you. We hope we got all elected. We put our agenda and mind together. We get something get done. But let me just say, we have a daunting challenge, inflation, many other. And just for instance, insurance. We have to lower our insurance or control the insurance cost. We cannot. So we have an idea about self-insured. But to do self-insured, it's a daunting, big issue. We need a great leadership to do that. We are not big enough to make our own self-insured. So we either have a great leadership to pull similar community together have a mutual some kind of insurance body or we can lobby like a, a lot to the state make joint power insurance authority. If we do that, we can control some of the insurance cost in the future. To do that, we need a great leadership who need uh, looking forward very proactive and very people skilled. We need somebody, something like that, looking outside the box. If we don't have it, we keep on saying same thing, keep on knocking same door. Thank you. Thank you very much, Moon. Um, it is Donna's go. 
do we have Donna at all, or we do, we do have Donna? Okay, great. Thank you very much, and my apologies for the connection problems early. It's been unstable all day. Um, in terms of, of my candidacy, I, I'll end as I began. I've had experience in on the board for three years. I've held several positions, been very active in committees, and feel that I've gained the knowledge that we need. Opinion is a great thing, and I have a whole lot of opinions about things, but the fact is we need the knowledge, the understanding. Um, we've heard we should self-insure. There's lots of consequences of doing that. And until we make those decisions, we need to have the knowledge of what that really means. And that really applies across the board. I have the community, the entire community, everyone who lives in it at, as my focus. And sometimes we will make decisions that don't please everybody. As someone once said, you can see please some of the people some of the time all, or all of the time and all of the people some of the time. You can't please all of the people all of the time. We try about this community. And if the community is wins, then ultimately in the end, we all win. And I hope that my experience and viewpoints agree with you and hope to see you again. On an, on an, in another term. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brad, wrap it up for us, please. All right, your very good questions kind of ruined my closing statement, so I'll go through parts of it. Uh, my colleagues are all very qualified for the board positions, and this is going to make your decision on who to vote for very difficult. I do believe that residents need to be more actively involved in compliance and cost control. We live here, it is our money and our lives, and those are affected by both compliance and what our money is spent on. One of the biggest concerns I have heard is on controlling costs. I am opposed to reducing costs through reducing services. You reduce costs through an effective bid process, contractor evaluation, and strong management of contracts. My business is based on bids from federal, state, and local government. So I'm very familiar with those processes and how to manage those costs. And more importantly, how to get quality goods and services and value for the money that you do spend it on. I currently spend over $3 million a year on various insurance coverages for my current business. I believe there are opportunities to have adequate coverage without excessive increases. And I tell everybody that works for me, this is very, this very statement. You need to spend more time figuring out a solution for me than you do making an excuse for why we can't do something. And I think you need to have people, especially the staff, make that extra effort and go through every single possible scenario before you have to fall back to a position that you can't get to where you want to be. Anyone who's very happy with everything that goes on here, don't vote to put me on this board. I believe in a very active board. I believe in very active board members. And I believe that that helps strengthen the results of the board. Thank you. Thank you very much. Andrew? Thank you. Hey, Jules, thank you. Your heart's in the right place. You've got a lot of great ideas. But I reserve the right to differ on details, respectfully. OK, you need some hard items here. And I'll give that to you. Yeah, we've got to keep costs down, keep this place affordable. And that's holding people accountable for their rightful duties. So it's nothing wrong in questioning how things are done. We ought to be doing it. In terms of revenue, I talked about it before. We've got to bring in outside revenue. We don't need to raise revenue on the backs of the residents. We need to look outside, and I think there's something there. I'd like to see us hire more residents as part-timers for sure. And I don't understand why people, if they live in the village here, why they can't work. Uh, you know, as staff. I don't understand that. We need to fix that. Uh, the, their loyalty will be to the village. To the village. Um, I could insist that VMS and GRF be as efficient as possible. And again, accountability. Uh, regarding activities and programs, inclusivity. Well, beginners welcome. If physical problems, we make accommodations for you. Everybody takes part. I think uh, Personal safety, I think we need better lighting, and we need, uh, we need things to prevent falls. Falls are terrible. There's, I think the village is behind on preventing falls. I'd like to see better lighting. I'd like to see the use of solar panels. 
more. Uh, regarding this disciplinary thing, there's something to it, Jules. There's something to it. I think we need to look at it in depth. In effect, and I've done this before, a very thorough audit. Are we in compliance with Davis Sterling? Where can we improve? It's got to be more resident friendly, whatever that means. Uh, in particular, I think that we have to look at the operations as residents, not as board members. We have to act in our own interest in that respect. Thank you. Thank you. Deborah, just under the wire. if you would be so kind. Oh. Sure, thank you. Welcome back. Thanks. I'm fully prepared to provide valuable support to the work of your mutual board through my extensive qualifications and experiences. With a diverse educational background and a wealth of professional expertise, I bring a unique set of skills and perspectives to the table. My academic journey has equipped me with a deep comprehensive knowledge base that allows me to approach challenges with a multidisciplinary perspective to contribute to informed decision-making processes. Having served as an instructor in the past 21 years in the legal assistant program and paralegal programs, I have developed strong communication and teaching skills. These skills enable me to effectively convey information, facilitate discussion, and collaborate with diverse stakeholders. In my previous role at Anoka Technical College, I actively participated in various committees. This experience has honed my ability to work in a team setting, listen to different viewpoints, and make informed decisions based on a comprehensive understanding of the issues at hand. My strengths as a maximizer, strategic achiever, and futuristic will prove invaluable in the support of the mutual board's goals and objectives. I have a natural inclination to identify opportunities for improvement, devise strategic plans, and drive towards achieving excellence. Additionally, my forward-thinking mindset enables me to anticipate future needs and trends, ensuring that the decisions made by the board align with long-term goals and aspirations. With my servant leadership style, I'm dedicated to putting the needs of the community first. I value diverse opinions and actively seek input from all residents to ensure inclusive decision-making processes. By cultivating that culture of trust, I aim to foster an environment where open dialogue, collaboration, and mutual respect thrive. As an advocate for residents, I deeply understand the importance of promoting the well-being and interests of the community members. I'm committed to leveraging my expertise and experiences to ensure that the decisions made by the board align with the needs and aspirations of the residents. Thank, I will actively. Thank you. You have yes. um, gone beyond your time limit. Sorry, I don't mean to cut okay, you off. Thank you. But you have um, certainly contributed to our um, event this morning. Appreciate that. Um, before we close, I'd like to thank Paul, who has <laughs> worked diligently to try to keep this thing connected. The course of true communication never runs that smoothly, okay? And I'd certainly like to thank all the candidates for volunteering your time. We, we are volunteers. We live in a community. There's no pay attached to any of this, okay? And <clears throat> I certainly appreciate your willingness to serve and I wish you all the best, whoever gets elected, okay? We have a lot to digest. To the members, be sure to vote. It's your right and your responsibility. Um, we live in a democracy. We thrive in a democracy. A ballot will be mailed out to you, <clears throat> excuse me, August 30th, and is due back by September 28th. Remember, there are six candidates for four seats. Thank you for hanging in there for two hours. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you.